Hey, welcome everyone, and thank you for joining us here at the Mechanics Institute for our cinema lit film series, of which this month we are featuring a series of films exposing Chinese stereotypes in films. And of course, as you know, this is part of our grant from the NEA Big Reads program, of which we'll be having several film series, author events, book groups, and salons that will continue throughout the year until June. So you can see our website for all the offerings that will be happening this year. I want to point out that this Thursday, the featured book of our annual Big Read will feature Charles Yu, author of Interior Chinatown, a novel, which won the 2020 uh, National Book Award. Uh, we will be having a Zoom interview with him. He is in LA and he'll be in conversation with Bay Area writer Bon Su. And that will be at six o'clock on Thursday, October 20th. And we hope that you'll join us or sign up for our Zoom program with Charles Yu and Bon Su. It should be really terrific. If you have not read the book, we do recommend it. It's here in the library and uh, it's an, an amazing read. It's a novel that's actually written as a screenplay. Also, I want to point out um, uh, this series is continuing, and uh, we'll also have another series that will be coming up in March, as well as a collaboration. But our guest speaker tonight is Stephen Gong, who's the executive director of the Cam Film Festival. And uh, we look forward to hearing from him. Yes, he'll be introducing our, our film, Shanghai Angel, and also be telling us more about the upcoming festival in New York. So, but please first welcome our curator and host, Matthew Kennedy, and our guest speaker, Stephen Gong. Thank you, Laura, and good evening, everybody. This is um, a wonderful event tonight. We just our second in the series that Laura uh, mentioned. And uh, I am very, very excited to introduce our uh, guest co-host tonight. He is making his Cinema Lit co-hosting debut this evening. <laughs> um, uh, I want to also just personalize this ever so slightly. Uh, I met Stephen, we met like 35-ish years ago. I was on on the staff of the California Arts Council, and Stephen was the um, uh, um, was served on the media arts panel um, repeatedly, and that's where we met, and so we know a lot of people in common and so forth. And when we were putting this series together, and I realized that he was currently the executive director of the Center for Asian American Media, I it was kind of a no-brainer that you know it's based here in San Francisco that uh, he should of course come and and. Uh, present to us during this, this month, and he has graciously agreed. So, uh, Stephen is the, as I mentioned, the Executive Director of the Center for Asian American Media. He's been there uh, in that capacity since 2006. Uh, his previous positions uh, have been in Arts Administration, including Deputy Director of the Berkeley Art Museum and the Pacific Film Archive, Program Officer in the Media Arts Program at the National Endowment for the Arts, Associate Director of the National Center for Film and Video Preservation at the American Film Institute. He has also lectured in the Asian American Studies Department at UC Berkeley, where he developed and taught a course on the history of Asian American media. In addition to writing about film history, Stephen uh, provided critical commentary on several DVDs, including Treasures from the American Archives, Volumes 1 and 5, which is a great treasure trove of early American film, that series. Uh, Chan is Missing, the seminal uh, independent film directed by Wayne Wang. And he also uh, was the featured historian documentary Hollywood Chinese. Does that ring a bell for anybody? <laughs> like who, everybody who was here last week, you've all, you already you know, become acquainted with Stephen through uh, his, his excellent commentary in Hollywood Chinese. 
He is also the board chair of the Center for Rural Strategies and serves on the advisory board of the San Francisco Silent Film Festival Society. So uh, without further delay, let's all give it up for our guest host, Mr. Stephen Gong. Thank you all. Um, yeah, if you saw the documentary, um, I didn't darken my hair in the documentary. This <laughs> um, it's a real pleasure to be here. Uh, I was telling Matthew, and, and afterwards, I'm still looking forward to our joint conversation. We, we reconnected, and, and uh, Matthew's quite a remarkable film historian at this stage in his career, and so deeply immersed in. You know, really be covering um, uh, exciting lives, the, the, the lesser known, but deeply important kind of lives. And we share a lot of the same impulses about film as cultural anthropology. And essentially in introducing tonight's film, that's kind of where I wanted to start because uh, what I would say is um, we do have this larger theme and an increased awareness of um, how powerful the film medium is and the many messages it gives. It's a glamorous, it's the most amazing kind of, to me, art form that uh, partakes of so many other art forms. You know, it is theater, it is visual, it is, it incorporates music and sound. It's, it, it envelops all of our senses and that's what makes it wonderful. But it also carries many values and it also communicates hierarchies of, of power in the world. And it tells, it we both reflects on the conditions uh, and, and structures of, of its day. And sometimes um, that when we look at it with today's lens, we can see, you know, deep issues and problems when you're depicting other people and you're not really involving those people from those cultures. So we'll be talking about that, and, and that is much of the work I do now. But in introducing the film, I actually want to present you with something different as we, as we look at the film before we talk about the lens we might have today. And that is to understand uh, what, it what it represents in its time. And that's where I make this connection with anthropology, because works like this Right, very much. If, if you imagine you were from a completely different culture in a different time, a hundred years in the future, you might wonder what is this thing we've seen? And obviously, too, I mean, even thinking about Anna May Wong, we may see Anna May Wong and think, you know, she has the same agency as Marina Dietrich. Um, but we know at the time in the motion picture industry, she didn't. Um, so, but, but I want us to enjoy the film first. So what, what I want to tell you is, I am so thrilled to be able to see this film again, because it involves two of the most intriguing creative figures. Well, you could say any number, three, four, five, but especially its director, Joseph von Sternberg, who was really one of the uh, most important early directors. Um, and, and his incredible relationship with Marlene Dietrich. They made seven films together, and they were almost all masterpieces of, her, of this particular period of film history, the early sound film. And they made these films for Paramount Studios, which was the most glamorous of all of the film studios. So one thing, uh, this picture was nominated for the Academy Award. It was the only the ninth year of the Academy Awards, but it was nominated for Best Picture and Best Director and Best Cinematography. It did, it only won the Oscar for Best Cinematography. But that was for Lee Garms. But I'll tell you, the, the visual look of the film is probably due to Joseph von Sternberg because all of his films, particularly with Marlene Dietrich, look as wonderful as this. He is really a visual master. He employed a moving camera that keeps you aware. He was in, deeply interested in how she would be lit. And she is 
glorious and glamorous. I also examined my mom. Uh, what else to tell you? He was sort of dictatorial. Uh, Joseph von Sternberg was born in Vienna. He, he, he did work in the German, the, the German film industry before he came over in the Sonic era, but then worked his, worked his way into uh, directing films here in, in the US. His big breakthrough film with Marlena Dietrich was The Blue Angel. And it's a film about a professor who right, falls in love with one, a much uh, younger student who, mm, who, who, who reverses the power dynamic on him. And, and it is said in film history that Dietrich's and von Sternberg's relationship was actually very much like that in real life. So, so I so watch this as an undercurrent. Five Brook will play the the, the British uh, romantic lead, but it's but you're looking at von Sternberg, uh, and you're looking at this power that each will have with him. Um, what else to say? Um, it is said. I, I know. I wonder. It is said that the great uh, Chinese American cinematographer uh, James Wong Howe worked on this film. Um, but it's not, we're not completely clear on what parts he did. But I will just say this as a personal reflection. My people, my family are from one particular uh, county sized area of Guangdong province uh, in southern China. Uh, it's called Toisan. And uh, in Mandarin, it's Taishan. And it's kind of thought of as we're, we're kind of. Uh, hillbillies of that part of China. But a lot of the first Chinese in America, in San Francisco, came from Tucson because it was not, you know, for, um, for a better life. I'm sorry, I keep realizing I'm losing, I'm not speaking directly. So, um, so I'm Tucsonese. So is Anna May Wong, she's Tucsonese. And so is James Wong now. He's Tucsonese also. So I feel like I've got relatives in the film. You know? <laughs> Uh, so anyway, we'll talk more about Anna May, but, but because of the theme, I did want to tell you, I, in some ways, this is a remarkable film for her, one of her very best performances. She's not on the screen for a long, long time, but I think you will see the very powerful kind of presence she has. And, and um, uh, you know, there's a notable uh, occurrence just recently announced uh, the U.S. Mint is about to put her on a, a, our 25 cent pieces, right? She will be the first Asian American on, on our currency and, and the first Asian American woman. So uh, maybe afterwards we can talk about um, about anime Wong and and in a way as a film historian, I, I have to admit, if it were that on credentials of sort of great performances, if you look into her filmography, you don't find much. Almost more than any other lead uh, uh, personality of American film history, her career was proscribed. I think if you saw the, I'm just thinking, realizing if you saw Hollywood Chinese, you heard, heard me say this, it was proscribed by race and gender. You know, she never really got the chance in, in, in short. Um, and so that's part of the reflection. But but tonight, as I say, enjoy what you're seeing. Enjoy the film. Let's talk about anything. Um, you know, it's purportedly based in China on a true incident. We can talk about that a little bit. We can talk about what is the depiction of China at the period. You know, this is deep in the throes of a certain kind of American uh, or Western imperialism in China. And it does relate to how the, or this figures in, if we want to understand China today and, and why, why China sort of feels like it is their time finally to redress how they were treated throughout the 19th and, and much of the 20th century, we'll say that. Um, and uh, yeah, I'll share what I know, but you know, I want to respect that so many of you as members of the community, as members of the Institute, are, are probably much better versed in, in history. And so I invite you to share what you know also as we enter into this conversation.
Okay, with that, let's get into it. I think just to start, there's so many points of discussion to go over. It's even over here in a moment. Um, but I doubt there's any um, mystery as to why this film was best in the world. Right? Lee Garns was a celebrated cinematographer, and as, as Stephen mentioned, there is there's some records that James Wong Howe, who's also a great um, cinematographer, did some of the work on this film that is not clear what. Certainly not the lighting and photography of Peter. That was Lee Garns and, and Hans Grimberg exclusively. But uh, let's you have a seat and here we go. Well, what you think, huh? Pretty good film. It was great. Well, I'll give you to start us on the conversation. Okay, well, I mean, there are lots of, you know, that's maybe lots of stuff to say. We certainly want to talk about anime long. Maybe I'll start by saying um, that my impression is that um, in the structure of this film, she is, she gets third villain, which is really quite remarkable. Because she has a lot less dialogue than most of the other the, the, the other passengers, besides that she leaves, that, that we get to know through the course of the film. And I'm wondering if there, in every scene of hers, you know, I'm, watching, I'm paying attention to her because that's sort of our, our focus here. Every scene of hers seems to be, to me, cut short. I want to know more about her. I want to know her, you know, her character's background. I want to sort of have some story of her that, that renders her ultimate Killing of Shang, um, that, it, that it makes sense. I mean, now we just have to take on faith, which of course is the theme of the film. Uh, that you know, she has she has her reasons, and you know, she's actually the hero of the piece in a way. But we really know nothing about her. And you know, the lady with the dog, and the, and Art Michael, the religious man, and the gambler. We all get to know better uh, than her. And I wonder if that was purposeful so that we have that kind of movie um, device where, you know, the plot's moving along and then suddenly, oh my gosh, suddenly this, you know, this person who's been in the shadows takes, uh, moves to the front and, you know, is absolutely in of the plot in kill The Killing of Chang. Uh, but we still don't know her, right? Through the entire film. She remains this, this mysterious figure. Um, it actually very limited screen time, which again kind of, kind of frustrates me. I kind of want to know more. But I'm also wondering if it was if it was purposeful and not not about um, avoidance of of um, screen time for a character for a Chinese character uh, role. But you know, this is one of those cases. I do think as we look at it today. And I invite you to do this. There, there's something that she's almost like a metaphor for the understanding of China at the time. So she's a stand in for China that has been victimized. You know, there's a certain kind of uh, modernity, and, and uh, well, there's, there's this incredible mixture of the, of the, of the trumped up sentimentality in a way of the love story, right? So the, against this backdrop of revolution. And, and the exotic, you know, China and these warring worlds. That's not really the story, you know, right? This is the story about a five-year love affair, you know, and a fallen woman. So that's that's the convention. But I think what I think I think uh, Ron Sternberg is a great storyteller, and I think he sees that the the trumped-up romance in a way. Is enriched by the exoticism of the locale. And, um, you know, certainly he doesn't want to get into the politics of the, of the revolutionary China at the time. This was during the, uh, the First Republic of China, but it was already a failing revolution. Sun Yat-sen Yat uh, created the First Republic of China in 1911. By 1917, 18, it was starting to fall. And this is sort of based on an incident of a real uh, halting of the train and holding all of its passengers for ransom that took place in 19, 
21 to 22. Um, but I, I don't think he cares about that either. Although I'll say that general has the worst security of any. Yeah. <laughs> anybody, can go anybody can walk into his bedroom. Yeah. But but he doesn't want to go there. But he but he is starting to paint this um, sympathetic picture of of the downtrodden Chinese, and that's what she is a fallen woman. Uh, so she's she can't be the heroine of the film. She's not really a hero. But but she presents this this sympathy, this sympathy, or or. Uh, the heroine of the ironically the, the sort of the, the the secondary story which is actually the, the civil war because at the end of the film you know you've got this very light scene about you know the, the the two leads are sort of playing on each other throughout the film in terms of their coy language and whatnot and at the end of the film the very last scene it's i'm almost like scratching my head saying knowing that it's coming to an end did we just watch a romantic comedy you know, I mean, <laughs> the wonderful way in which Von Sturberg is able to um, oscillate between a very, very serious story of, you know, upheaval and, and uh, civil war. I mean, we see an execution, we see a train being taken over, etc. We see, you know, this sadistic general who has kind of a, a fascination with fire that's pretty scary, right? And we're also having this, this lovely banter back and forth, you know, and like criticisms, and not just from the two characters, the two leads, but it's a, it's a remarkable juggling act, I think, that he's able to achieve. Um, and, and both work, I think. Um, Good. Let's, let's yeah. bring some folks out in on the conversation. Yeah. We'll start here, and then I know there's a hand in the back. Go ahead. I, I agree. I saw it in comedies, and every, every time, every person knew it was a stereotype. From one time I'm familiar to us now, uh, maybe not at that time. And what affected me most was the photography, the way the the Iron Rooster, the train was from. I love the train. The train for me made the film. And uh, I think she was also for Mario Dietrich was filmed in a very interesting way as well. But they overstayed it, you know, so it became awfully gooey in the end. And as for the uh, anime Wong, I think I agree with you. She typified something mysterious and unknown. You didn't know what to expect, what's coming next. You know, the idea of this mysterious China and all that, as you're interpreting it, I agree with that too. But again, she was a stereotype. Because at that time, that was a stereotype of the sort of dragon lady, mysterious, and peaceful. <laughs> you don't know what she's going to do next. You know, yes, yes, thank you. Um, uh, Susie Wong, you know, um, the world of Susie Wong or Love is a Many Splendor thing. Yes, the, the Chinese prostitute is one of the reoccurring roles that we will see in Hollywood film to have a sympathetic character. Uh, you'll see in, in the good earth it's also of course a long suffering peasants um but just yeah i mean i don't want to overplay it it is the this this film is this film is just is its own piece but uh yeah the, marlena dietrich's costumes did you see that her black feathers white feathers fur you know black her, her, the wardrobe must have taken up an entire car. I mean, how many trunks yeah. were Look, those things she yeah. had really well. Oh, oh gosh. Yeah. Yeah. Just, yeah. It was delightful to see her. And then what I'm thinking and saying is this contrast of the blonde, right? And so so when Strindberg is continental, right? So he's not really an American. So you don't see a lot. It's not an American film. This is like a European film in a way. And he is really getting into her. And she's contrasted so interestingly, you know, the, the blonde and the, the black hair. It was, yeah, I just find that uh, uh, wonderful to kind of think about. Uh, but in the back, yes, please. Yeah. Um, I think it's pretty clear why anime Wong kills Chang. I mean, the character kills Chang because she was raped and possibly gang raped. I mean, it's very clear to me that her motivation and also having her be raped for the narrative purpose of showing 
the stakes that Marlena Dietrich was choosing when she offered herself in exchange for the doctor. So it wasn't that like, to me, it was very, very clear what the stakes were and, and that her role in that narrative. Right. Thank you. Yeah, well, that's true. That, that leads me to something. What did you all make of the Clive Brook character, the, the British doctor? Does anybody want to? <laughs> do, do you think his performance, that really stiffness, <laughs> and, and what do you think? Do you think, um, do you think, you know, like, is it, it was, what he, was he miscast or was von Sternberg directing exactly like he wanted? Him to perform. You know, what is with their relationship? And how long does it take him to have faith in her? I mean, it's all, I find that there is a almost a, it's, it's Von Sternberg is being play, playful about it, exactly how stiff he can make life work. Look. Well, and maybe how, how um, dim witted the man can be when he's so hopelessly in love, right? He doesn't figure out that right away that. That Lily is just playing, you know, that, that there has to be an exchange if uh, he's going to be set free. And, and that's Lily, and Lily doesn't want to. But if she says she doesn't want to in the presence of Chang, then, you know, somebody's going to wind up dead, right? And he doesn't seem to figure that out until, interestingly, I believe it's the moment with, the, the, with Carmichael, yeah, right? Carmichael the, the, the religious man. Who I think, you know, maybe of all the characters in the film has the greatest sort of um, psychological transition, right? He is extremely judgmental of the women in the beginning. He doesn't even want to lay eyes on them. And at the end, he's saying, you know, Lily's a better person than you are, Harvey. I mean, you know, get with the program here. I mean, see, you know, what, what she's doing, what she has to do in order to, to save your save your sight as well as you know, potentially your life. Great. So that brings up, I'm sorry, yeah, let's go ahead. I just want to have a um, clarification. Marlene Dietrich says to, um, you know, the military British guy, make some explanation about um, the, you know, the, the Chinese woman with her. Says, oh, I'm just being nice to her. Or what is that comment that he, that she says? Because she, she, she makes an explanation for Anna Wong. Or am I just making that up? I know that there's some, it's like she's introducing her to the audience. Yeah, do you, what did you I, I, I interpret it as to be able to eat in the dining car without being harassed and be treated and served so it was according to, to her, what she paid for. So she, she wanted the doctor to accompany them to the dining car so that they would be legitimized. Yeah, that was the scene. Oh, good, thank you. But that is it. And he, and he, and that's interesting because he misses in, entirely and does not step up. Um, and so, the, but these, these, these are women who work together. What is? We don't even well, know. No, they only they only get in the car together because the because the one guy refuses. Her, yeah, refuses well, to be in the car with her. The, the two women actually, I, I believe, have no relationship to each other okay. prior until, to until until society leaving. puts them together. And in fact, yeah. they're. You know, a, a few times through the film, it's sort of there's a point made that these two are not necessarily bonding. We might expect them to because they're two women traveling alone and because of their shared profession. Okay, but they know. really, and I keep sort of almost wishing that, like, can we have a little sister in here? You know, like, you know, advance advance your 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 own self interest with each other. But they actually don't really. Well, the, okay, so now we can dish a little bit. Yeah. It, it, is, it is rumored that they became quite close during the film of this, this movie. Yeah, I and mean, Enemy Wong's sexuality was, all, was always in question during her life, but it's quite clear uh, she, was, she was gay, and Marlene the teacher is sort of famously gone. Yeah. Um, I didn't know that. I was I was thinking of the narrative. <laughs> I didn't realize that. But this is Hollywood confidential. There we go. <laughs> but let's not let that overshadow. You know that that. Um, but you know, I think the important thing, if you think about the depiction of of uh, prostitution and 
and this notion of, of even the reverend, you know, seeing through his faith a more deeper value. This is a pre Hayes Code film. So this film comes out in 1932. 1934 is the Hayes Code. For those of you who don't know, there was a uh, a censorship board because there was an increasing, this is the kind of film that was starting to make um, the kind of blue noses a little bit nervous about um, immorality in motion pictures. And uh, pretty soon the, uh, the studios held to a code of self-censorship because they were afraid of greater restrictions coming down from the government on us. They policed it. So you would have seen a probably a clear co condemnation of any kind of fallen woman or the need for them to repent. And yet we see, and, and that's part of the, the mystery of Anna Wong's character, is that we don't learn how and, and under what circumstances she is a fallen person. And, and just as importantly, that Sean and Lily has that, yeah, it's like a comedy line. It took more than one man to change, to, to make my to make me a yeah. I think the uh, award for the best hairstyle goes to the woman with the dog. That's <laughs> <laughs> wig, yeah. Her hat was it? You know, it, yeah, but truly, it, you, it seems to me Von Sternberg is really being able to play with, with using uh, costuming and hair to convey. Uh, crucial aspects of character. Mm -hmm. um, this is really slightly off subject, uh, but I want to make sure it's mentioned before the end of the evening. Um, in 1933, uh, Footlight Parade, which is a big splash of the birth of musical from Warner Brothers, the, another studio, uh, had a huge production number called Shanghai Lil. And when that, there was a, a character named Shanghai Lil played by Ruby Keeler, of all people. Who was in yellow face and it's a, a, again a huge production number i bring it to your attention only because it sort of points to the a, a topical cultural reference to this movie it was big enough uh that that there was this production number from another studio that basically was a very direct reference to shanghai lily uh, and it's very it's it's amusing because like Dozens and dozens of men in this production member know Shanghai Lil. Okay, so it's it's almost a comic approach to you know Shanghai Lily's profession and thing. Um, it's it's just something to look at from that, that was contemporary with this film or, or a, a, a near reference point in in popular culture. Great, thank you. Um, so maybe for a moment to to do justice to the series, let's talk about. Let's talk about the depiction of Chinese and uh, and what it's what it seems to be telling us about China about the period. And as I said to you, you know, as, as a Chinese American, I'm looking back at it now. And I mentioned this to Matthew earlier this evening. You know, when I was younger and just studying film, I was I was um, I was probably giving more of a pass to um, people who were making movies at this time, American movies, and. And yet, um, you know, part of the depiction, part of the background of having it was this is like the movie of Grand Hotel, if you've ever seen that, where you have, you know, six characters, each representing different nationalities. So let's take a look at there's a French uh, military person, there's a, you know, British officer, there's the, the person who was uh, wearing the, the kind of fez. I wasn't sure what nationality, but. But they were colonized, right? Because these were different uh, European countries and, and the United States who at that time had forced China, the Chinese empire when it was weak during the 19th century, had forced them to open up China. Uh, there was a reference to opium. It is well known now that the British um, had a policy of importing opium from Afghanistan and, and addicting the Chinese people so that they, they could create a market in China. So the, the film does not go into it, but it's traced, colonialism is traced in the movie. And um, as I say, they don't, they neither valorize the rebels, which you might expect it, even you know, in a Star Wars kind of way, or, certain, or the government. 
Neither one is given any kind of real agency in the film. Instead, we accept that the Europeans, the, that the British guys, right? It is their right to kind of rule over this, this uncivilized or, or chaotic uh, uh, country. That is the narrative of colonialism. And this narrative is rooted in that. And, I, and to me, as I look at it today, and we look at the geopolitics, and I, I tell you, you know, so I, you know my view of, of China does evolve. But, but even in these last 20 years, and with Xi Jinping, you're clearly a des despot like so many leaders, but lest we feel superior, we elected one here ourselves. Um, um, the fact is that this Chinese government has now raised 700 million human beings out of abject poverty. And uh, as I say, the Chinese people, in a sense, have have the and the or the Chinese leadership has not forgotten a century and a half of the way that the West has treated them. And so the so I think there is something to saying this film is an artifact, right, of a popular of, of how America can make a glamorous romantic comedy drama. And, and ignore, in a sense, the real setting and, and the real suffering that was going on that had been imposed on the Chinese people at the time. And that's kind of this view that I have now as a senior person watching films that I would not have had even 20, 30 years ago when I first met myself. So perhaps they probably what does that do to your uh, ultimate affection or respect for the film? Oh, I still love I still love this film, but I am I mean I see all film in a different way. So so thank you, Matthew. And Blake. you know, in these last I was um I preserved American film. We restored Lost Horizons, wonderful film about the the a narrative about in between the world wars and maybe that there was a greater wisdom of the East. So I've spent much of my life celebrating American film. And yet, um, the, this, I always held on to something about this emerging notion of being able to control our own narratives. Uh, and, and that's why uh, a group of us, in a sense, 42 years ago, started the organization that I now am the executive director of, the Center for Asian American Media. And the premise of this, you know, quite simply, is that, um, you know, not that every film needs to be made by the people who are purported, the purported subjects of it, but film is enriched and our culture is enriched when we are all given uh, access to the tools to tell, to be part of storytelling. And so I have this other kind of feeling now about the films that I would want us to make or be involved in. Um, uh, not to rely on the marketplace in a way, to, to you, you know, and, and the thing we give up is, is in some ways a united sort of single approach to uh, a, a cultural belief, but we have to make way for this multiplicity of voices and appreciate what each kind of expression brings to the mix. Um, so, so that's my soapbox, but I'll tell you, I, I think this film stands up because it doesn't give us simple homilies. Von Sternberg is a very complicated character, and I think, I think he, he presented a lot, he's aware of a lot of contradictions, I guess I would say, too, of faith, you know, he, he does, he's kind of caricaturing the, you know, the intolerant, ridicules the lady with the dog in a way. But yes, and, and, and at first, I think he was doing that with the reverend, but the reverend does come around to be the moral voice of something deeper, if if romantic love, which is a Western concept that's right, that the Chinese have had varying degrees of, of um, adherence to in terms of choosing one's mate, let's say, right? This is a 
but this is a real, this is a Hollywood approach to romantic love trumps everything. It trumps revolution. It trumps, right, a fallen uh, uh, sort of state. Uh, that's kind of an interesting, yeah, that's, that was maybe the genius of Hollywood in, in United. I was just going to say that that transcends this film, right, in terms of, you know, Hollywood can make everything all better, right, for an hour and a half, uh, and this is a, perhaps a, a sterling example of that. We'll go back first. Okay. I just, I was curious where it was filmed because there are quite a few, like a remarkable amount of seemingly actual Asian, Asian American extras and um, only one person potentially in yellow face that I could see, which was pretty unusual for the time, you know? Uh, so it's sort of- oh, this was usual for the time. I mean, it's unusual to even have the young and mom character in a way. No, that's what I'm saying. To, oh, have, okay. to have only one of the leads, because it was uh, Chang who wasn't actually Asian American, right? Or, or, yeah, he was. Yeah, he's, he's the only yeah. character who's supposed to be Asian or part Asian to not actually be Asian, which seems really unusual to me for that time period, to have, or even now. You know, I mean, we thank you for. Uh, you know, I should let you have your comment first. And now. Oh, okay. It's it's quite different. Um, you said something about um, how the story seems to be detached and ignoring the context in which all of this is really playing out. And so I was wondering how you would rewrite the film, how you would rewrite the film oh. in order to bring that up without spoiling any of the aesthetic. Aspects of it. This would. <laughs> uh, Zhang Yimou made a film called To Live during the 90s. You know, he's called the fifth generation Chinese directors. And he made, yeah, he made this film about the, the Chinese Revolution. Um, and, and I think not till we get, it, it, you need to get much further. I don't think this, I don't think you can really bring that in to the Mushy Brand. The Chinese speak to it, um, or you know, Bernard Lucci's uh, Last Emperor, which is a really you know another European director, but he centralizes right the Chinese characters, and you have a couple of British characters, but then you see them as the secondary. So it's hard to imagine in in the way that we tell story, right? It's hard to imagine how you can uh, really really great parody among all because the perspective of uh, whose perspective you take is so crucial. But uh, did you have a how else? Okay, well, I'm going to I want to talk about Warner Olin for a minute because I am a big fan of Warner Olin and, and uh, he gets a lot of flack. You know, Warner Olin played Charlie Chan in the first series of Charlie Chan films. They're the best. And and I really and I as I understand it, too, Ski Luke plays number one son in the in the first run of the 20th century Fox Charlie Chan films, and later on they got much more comedic as Sidney Pollard played him. Uh, but in the Warner Bowen Chan's, he really actually uh, he, he Luke in his memoirs mentions they had a father son relationship, and and they adored one another, and Warner Bowen. He was a Swedish uh, actor, and uh, and yet he always believed that the Swedish people, kind of like the uh, Finnish, actually must have come from Asia first, because he always felt a deep connection to, to Asia. And uh, this, this film is before the Charlie Chan series starts. There had been a couple of other now that I think about it. A silent film versions, but they didn't stick. But the big Charlie Chan things start in 1936. This is 1932. But Warner Olin had already played a number of uh, Asian characters, and he he always did. And he did those are that's not eye makeup for him. That's how he looked in life. So one of those things. I just find him uh, a very interesting actor, and I enjoy his performances. 
Yes. Well, one thing I've noticed over the, you know, I watched all the old movies when I was a kid. A lot of the former Owens were always interested in me. Was he did very frequently play Asians, but he was always there was always something co relatively complex about them. Even this guy, like that that line where he says, "I'm not proud of being that white." It was kind of an interesting line to that movie in that year. And yeah, thank you. Right, that's that's exactly kind of how I feel. And he always shows up, and he's not. He was about. He was a very cheesy werewolf movie. <laughs> he plays. He plays a, a Japanese explorer in London who was living in London, who ends up. You know, he's the one who's the source of the werewolf. He plays in this. this um, it's interesting. He plays him speaking perfect English. He just happens to be Japanese, and he's a scholar, and he happens to be a werewolf. <laughs> <laughs> And it's not, there are no stereotypes in the way he portrayed Asians, at least not in that film. Now, in Charlie Chan's movies, of course, he was talking in fortune cookies, but. Yes, but the, and definitely, but well, this is going to be way too inside. But if you if you watch as many as I have, try to get, you know, if you get a chance, almost any of his, he only did like eight or nine of them. And then Sidney told her there's about 13 of them. But but they get much more fortune cookie and kind of outrageous as, as it goes to uh, Republic Studios. But when it was 20th Century Fox by Charlie Chan at the Olympics, Charlie Chan and Honolulu, they're really his performances are quite good, and his his dialogue with, with number one son with he looked are really wonderful. He was so, based on a real a real yeah Chong Apana yes. was a real Honolulu detective. And yes, as and and <laughs> if you want to, if we if we do another series on there's on on the we're, Chan, we're we can planning on it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, and Lauren, I was just going to say, I mean, she has a very small part on the side, so but there was a retrospective, maybe cast one, I'm pretty sure, it was a few years ago that I went to because my mother was a big fan and Lauren. Technical film. 
Um, and she was just a teenager. It's her first film. It's her first film, and she stars in it. But it's a remaking of. Um, Now, but anyway, it's now set in China, but it's a white officer goes and, you know, has an affair. She has a baby. He promises to return. She gets all her hopes up. And then he goes back and, and falls in love. Yeah. He falls in love with this. Yeah. 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 Wasn't yeah. that at the Sound Film Festival about three years ago? It's, it, it returns every so yeah. often. Okay. And, and um, yeah, she's quite good in it. Actually, I talked about her in uh, Hollywood Chinese because she she really is a, a wonderful presence. Yeah, film. And I think it, I don't know if it's the film you're thinking of, but if you all get a chance to see a British film called Piccadilly, uh, she's only in the first part of it. She's actually uh, a a victim of a murder, but but she has a scene or two that are really remarkable, really really wonderful. But that's why I say about anime is. You know, I, I, I find it remarkable that your mother would find her an important actress because the, her filmography is not real extensive where she is the star of the film. She's even in the silent film, she's in like the thief of bad Hat, but she's like a slave girl. She she has bit parts. And um, I just find that there weren't roles for her. There, the, 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 the studio system was not set up at that time. And that's where we could touch on yellow face or, you know, to, to be exotic was Rudolph Valentino because he was Italian and that was exotic, you know, right? So you're talking about, and for all of that, the, the default was how to not offend white Protestants audiences. So you weren't really going to be promoted. You know, once we get into the 30s, um, you just don't, you don't see depictions of people of race. And then of course, you know, African-Americans, and I'm old enough to remember, uh, Sir Sidney Bonte just passed away. I'm sure most of you just looking around, remember when Harry, Harry Belafonte and Sidney Poitier made it a point of saying, we, we have to make only positive roles because there were no real roles for black actors, right? There was this whole sub-industry of race film but not in Hollywood film. Um, and so, uh, you know, this is just part of the legacy. We are in a different state now, thank goodness, a different stage of evolution in our filmmaking, but it was not that long ago. Because in the 50s, it was still a big, big deal, right? Guess who's coming to dinner? Could you see a white perk actor kissing a black actor, particularly a black male kissing a white woman? Completely taboo. So anyway, that again. Sorry if, uh, but 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 if we revisit film, that's what we've got to revisit too. And if you think about, it's not. I, I guess I'm making a, an apology for the opportunities that anime won but not. Well, and to make your point about uh, a black man kissing a white woman in 1967, that was a big deal, right? And guess who's coming to dinner? Uh, when uh, Barbara Stanwyck in 1932 made the bitter tea of General Yen, a Swedish actor, Nils Astor was hired to be General Yen, and the two of them are are doing quite a bit of heavy kissing in that film, and it looks amazing because he's you know playing a Chinese character, but the the powers that be at the time, this was a, also a pre-code film, said what well, was perfectly all right to watch a lingering kiss between a Chinese character role, Chinese man and a, a white woman, if everybody knows that the, that the uh, Chinese role is in fact being played by a European actor. So it, it's, it's twisted and whatever, but it does, it does reveal, you know, what was considered offensive by that, by that uh, white majority that you're speaking of. And, you know, what, what was okay and what wasn't okay. In that respect. Yeah, and um, and as a young person wanting to, yeah, that's why I it was you get imprinted like this. I was imprinted to want to be white, actually. You know, yeah. Took me took me till college and I started being more comfortable with my I guess I'm comfortable. I know I'm something different, but all of your conception of what is normal, what is acceptable, is this default that we've had to work through.
<laughs> oh, but I but some you know any other comments of someone who has it if we've got any other this is so enjoyable that I don't want to uh, overstay the welcome. Um, thank you, Matthew. Yeah. Well, this is you know I sometimes I get into language shift here, but I can't resist. Um, oh, you mentioned you referenced Grand Hotel in this film. And uh, a review when this film came out just a few months after Grand Hotel was released in the same year, referred to it as Grand Hotel on Wheels. Um, and it's interesting to look at what's happened in terms of sort of structure of storytelling. The Grand Hotel style is referred to uh, still to this day, and you know, it's sort of shorthand for a film with a multitude of stars in it. It's basically an ensemble, but it's sort of a high-end ensemble with famous people. And they're usually thrown together in a collective place that's, that's confined, like a train or a boat or an airplane. And there's usually some disaster or, you know, a crisis. Um, and so we have these parallel stories. We get to know each one of the characters, but then they, uh, and they intersect or don't. Um, the difference, I think, between, and it's just interesting because Grand Hotel is given credit as being the sort of progenitor of this style. And, you know, this goes into the disaster movies of the 70s. It goes into Agatha Christie murder mysteries that are still being produced. Yeah, and, so and, so yeah, yeah. and so forth. But Shanghai Express, I think, is an interesting example of almost that style, but not quite, because you, it, you, you have a major hierarchy going on here in terms of the cast, right? But you do have that essence of every, you know, these, these a multitude of characters being thrown together in a confined space with a crisis. I mean, in that way, it's very similar, I think, to what became the Grand Hotel style. It just doesn't have, you know, a cast of such luminaries that they have to be listed alphabetically, right? It's like, no, this is our Lady Beatrix movie, and everybody else sort of falls in line. Um, just, I, I, just bring that up as, as a kind of, um, I don't know that, that a lot of films have gone into this structure that, that we saw tonight, well, as opposed to what Grand Hotel we have, but that, that has this sort of stronger film traditions to enter the storytelling and casting. Right. I'll just, I, I wonder if for you, if one of the pleasures is just seeing how you can create uh, China, on the back lot of Paramount. And, uh, you know, done so beautifully, uh, the, the, uh, the cows on the train, you know, cows on the tracks, great scene, you know, but it does give you this flavor, right? Uh, that was wonderful. And just the, uh, yeah, the lighting, the shadows, just the, just the long tracking shot of, of the train, of the soldiers coming on and the lighting. So beautiful. Yes. Well, there was just one image that I just loved, and it was near the beginning, and it was after it's shown the chaos of the, the train leaving. And you see, they keep showing the soldiers' shadows against the train in militaries constantly. But I don't know if you noticed it, but at one point there's a bayonet that's in the foreground, and it's got a cabbage stuck oh. on the end of it. And it's like whoever, whatever the soldier was, he probably, my guess was, as someone was going by, you know, basically it was this way of standing in cabbage. It's being held up. And it's this, it was just, every time I've seen it, I've always noticed that. It's in the Sternberg wanted you to see it. Or where oh, I'm going to have to go. Yeah, yeah it is near, see it. it's near the forefront, and it's a cabbage <laughs> in tail on a um, on a <laughs> Well, thank you. Thank you all. I'd also say a few words before we close to thank Stephen Gong for a wonderful conversation and Matthew Kennedy, our host and curator. I want to make a note about one more thing. We have our co-sponsor for tonight and for the series is the Chinese Historical Society. They're presenting an exhibition called Radiating Bruce Lee, which is open now for a few months. And also we're gonna have a tour 
to the society to view that exhibition. And they have a film series, film series that's going on. It'll be starting in, in late October and November. And so I want to encourage you to go to that series on Saturday nights, which will be in Chinatown and different venues. Um, so please watch out for announcements about Radiating Bruce Lee and also their film series that will also be a parallel to the exhibition. Also, a little promotion, my theater group is co-producing co Indecent at the San Francisco Playhouse. So pick up a flyer. Um, it's you can pick up right away the flat, you know, outside the door. And if you use the code community20, you get a 20% discount. So uh, pick up your flyer and I hope you join us at the theater as well as at the Chinese Historical Society.